Aloha. Aloha and welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. And my name is Jane Sugimura. I'm your host today. And we, we're going to be do, doing a legislative update uh, with uh, my uh, good friend and guest, Senator Sharon Moriwaki. And we've got a lot to talk about. I don't even know if we're going to have time to hit every, uh, hit all the issues. So let's get started. Uh, can I introduce uh, my guest? Welcome to uh, Condo Insider, Senator Moriaki. Thank you, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here with you. A uh, very good friend and and what I who I call the condo queen. <laughs> Get all my information from Jane. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to to be here with you uh, and uh, give you a, what what few bills passed. Unfortunately, I wish there were more. Yeah. But I think two two bills are important bills uh, for us anyway. Uh, I sit on the um, on Waterfront Towers Kakaako Board, uh, and and these are two bills that that um, really help condo owners. So uh, I'm pleased at least we have these two bills. There are others right. uh, that we can work on in the interim. But uh, and you know why, why don't we give our listeners some background? I mean, you're oh. the senator of the 12th senatorial district. What does that include? Well, it's a big district. It's a pretty much the urban area. It, it covers Kaka'ako, uh, Makali Mo'ili Ili, Ala Moana, and Waikiki. So it's, uh, it's a broad, a very diverse area from the um, apartment buildings and some of the, the single family dwelling units, but mostly along Kaka'ako and Waikiki. Really, I think we have the, the highest number of, of condo dwellers in the state. Uh, so Condo living and uh, looking at laws that can really help all of us who live in condos are very important, near and dear to, to me. And, uh, and, and I, I really appreciate Jay's doing this insight, Condo Insider, because we all really need to be educated on um, how we can be better condo dwellers, as well as knowing the laws that can protect our interests. Well, you know, why don't we get started? I mean, you mentioned that, you know, two laws, two bills have passed out of the legislature. But when the legislature opened, there were several condo bills. Uh, I mean, there must have been at least 20, right? And, and that includes companion bills. In fact, the first bill we're going to be talking about is House Bill 599, which was a companion bill to the one you introduced. That's right? correct. Senate Bill 784. That's correct. That's right? correct. Yes. And yes. this was about association uh, governance. And, 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 and one of the things that, you know, th that resulted from this pandemic is you had condominium associations who couldn't hold annual meetings, Correct. right? Because their governing documents and the statute didn't allow them to do remote hearings. We were allowed to do remote board hearings, board meetings. Right. Right. We couldn't do annual meetings. And yet, and there were other types of community uh, associations like uh, the 421J, you know, the community associations and the co-ops who are regulated by 21I and the, you know, the uh, Hawaii uh, corporate laws, right? They were allowed, you know, through their, through the statute and their governing documents to do remote hearings so they could do it. So it was only condos basically. I couldn't do their annual meetings. So what does what does 599, what does House Bill 599 and Senate Bill 784 do for condos? It's it's very it's very extensive in terms of um, allowing for uh, condos to meet during the pandemic. So the governor has to proclaim that it's an emergency situation. So during the pandemic, it really was important. But for other areas, you know, on the Big Island, if you you were to be hit by you know a, a um, uh, the volcanoes or or if you have a major disaster and you still need to meet for your either annual meeting or um, a special meeting to, to even decide what to do in your condo, this bill, is, it goes into effect that during that time, you can meet remotely. So you could meet either by phone or by, by uh, remote, uh, like your computers, hopefully they work, uh, and not have to meet physically. And especially during the pandemic, when we had to social distance and we were clustering in our own units, not even being able to meet in the condo, uh, this was really important. I know that I sit on 
um, a board for our condo and we didn't know what to do. <laughs> we knew we had to meet, but we kept on continuing it uh, until we got some indication from the governor's proclamation that condos you know, could, could meet, but it was very temporary. So this law puts into place anytime um, the governor just declares an emergency situation, we can meet. And we know now there are procedures in place now by law that uh, we can meet remotely and how to meet. So I think it's a good bill. Uh, hopefully the governor, I'm sure governor will sign it because it's a very important bill on condos and governing yourselves because we all are self-empowered. So we really do need to meet. Uh, it's just, how do we do it? And you know, for the people who are wondering how, how long does the governor have to, to sign this bill? He has, okay, so there, um, I think it's a 45 day period to veto. So in, I think it's um, in about, I, I can't tell you for, for certain, but there's a period um, in June that uh, he has to declare whether he's, he has an intent to veto. And I think July 6th might be the day that, the last day for him to veto. So um, we've got some time, but but I think people who want this bill would be um, it would behoove them to to write to the governor and say we want this bill. It's very important to us in condo. And this would be House Bill five nine nine, and they can House do it bill. by email, right? Yes. And call yes. the contact the governor's office and say please uh, sign this bill. So the governor really has two choices: he can either sign the bill, or he can uh, indicate he's going to veto it. And at that point, he does a letter, right? And all, and all the letters, legislators will probably uh, send it out. And, and you, of course, will send it to me if, yes. if, if, the, if the governor's going to veto. And then, sure. uh, then we get all our uh, people to then start emailing and calling the governor's office and say, oh, no, you know, don't do that. It's on your veto list. But, you know, this is a mistake. You got to sign it, right? And right. what if he doesn't do either? What if he doesn't sign it, he doesn't veto it? If he doesn't sign it, or he doesn't veto it, let's say if he doesn't veto it, uh, then it will go into law without his signature. So the big, big trigger is when he intends to veto, then Jane, you have to pull your forces on condo insider and write to him because uh, I do know that bills that he were on the list to veto have not been vetoed with because he's gotten input from the community and for others, stakeholders. So it's mm -hmm. really important to let him know. And as soon as we get that veto list, and if any of these bills are on it, Jane, for sure, I will let you know, and you can let your viewers know. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. So anyway, so for our viewers, we know that that 599 is, is on its way to the governor, or it has been already sent to the governor. So he has three choices can either sign it and it becomes a law right away because it's effective upon approval. That was one of the changes that we asked the conference committee, uh, conferees to make it when it was in conference because that seemed to be the only disagreement. They had an effective date of something like January 1, 2022 or something like that. So, you know, we contacted both sides, the conferees to say, oh, please, please, you know, make it effective upon approval. That way, that means when the governor signs it, it becomes, you know, the law and condos can hold their annual meetings remotely, right? Correct. Okay, well, good. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Annual meetings, special meetings, you know, when, whenever the, the association needs to meet, it can be done remotely and there are procedures in the bill. So I think it's a really good bill. Okay, so we're keeping our fingers crossed and, you know, and, and, and you know, during the process, we didn't have any opposition. We had people who, who commented on certain changes and yes, we went back and forth about the changes, but there was no opposition to, to the idea of allowing condos to hold their annual meetings remotely. So I think, you know, I think we're on a pretty good path. And so hopefully we don't make governor's veto list and you know, he will either sign it or let it you know, become law without doing anything. So like I said, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Okay, the next one is Senate Bill 329, and this one is your bill. It is, and it's a good bill because we who live in condos don't have much space to begin with. So when people abandon, whether it's bikes or, or any kind of 
of personal equipment that they leave around in common areas, it's a nuisance and sometimes a liability because you can trip over <laughs> these the equipment, you know? So this bill is, is really a, a, a good bill for those of us uh, in condos that want to get rid of people's trash. Um, they leave it if they've abandoned it. This bill has two, two case scenarios. One, if the owner is still on the premises, so you give them notice. It tells you how much time you can give them notice. And if they don't respond or they don't take away their, their bike or whatever equipment, then you can, you can dispose of it. You can sell it. You can trash it. You can, um, you can give it to charity. But it gives the, the association the right to proceed with getting rid of that nuisance. Um, the other scenario is if the person no longer lives in the building and it allows the association to just remove it. So again, it's just keeping your building safe, um, clean, um, rid of nuisances and trash uh, so that um, it helps everybody have a better, nicer building. And in the, in the previous statute, uh, there was some language that was taken out it, uh, uh, under the previous law, there was language in the bill that said that if you didn't know who who you know who who the stuff belonged to, you had to run an ad in the newspaper, right? And we all know with the monopoly paper that we have, it's very <laughs> expensive to run <laughs> an ad in the newspaper. And so this comes out of the association's pocket, which all seems right. kind of useless because if you you know if, if they abandon and if it's junk, you know that to make an association file you know, a notice in, in, in the star advertiser, you know, for this stuff that somebody <laughs> want anyway, right? And and sometimes it costs, you know, hundreds of hundreds of dollars, maybe even a thousand dollars to run those legal ads. And so it gets to be kind of expensive. But that was removed, mm -hmm. right? It was removed, correct. It it allows the association to move quickly. So either you get rid of the nuisance, you know, trash the trash, <laughs> or um, if there, it is an owner on premises, then you, you give them notice. You, you, you write to them and you say, hey, get rid of your stuff or we're going to get rid of it for you. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a simpler, less expensive for all owners in the building. And again, condo living is self-governance. Self so you know, we have the right to take care of our building. So if, you know, if, if one of your owners or an owner who's moved can't clean up after themselves, I think we have the right to do that. Right. And, you know, uh, so, so, so this bill made it out of the legislature. This one is also on its way to the governor. Correct. Right. So the same thing applies to this bill. He can either sign it into law and it becomes law right away, or he can put it on his veto list. And of course, if that happens and you will let us know, we will let all of our listeners know that they have to write or call the governor to make sure that, you know, he, allow, he, you know, he allows this to become law or he does nothing and it becomes law sometime in July. Right. Right. So we will know by July um, where these two bills are. Okay. They both will be signed. Yeah. Uh, we will have new law that will help us take better care of our property. And then just before the show started, you and I were talking about one of the bills that didn't make it out. And that was the one on non-judicial foreclosure. And what were the issues with that one? You know, I, and this is what I don't understand because I was following that bill. It passed the Senate uh, and it went to two committees in the House. The first was a Consumer Protection Committee. It's, it, it, it sailed through that one, uh, but it got stuck in judiciary. And I don't know, I was trying to read the testimony because I, you know, that was in the other House. And it seems that there might be some misunderstanding about the bill because this bill allows the association to not have to go through, again, the expense of, of publishing and, and going through the courts uh, when someone uh, doesn't pay their maintenance fees and it builds up. And, and uh, you know, some of these units are also abandoned. The person has not been able to pay uh, and they're no longer around and they're not paying the maintenance fees that all condo association owners split the cost on, on maintaining the building. So um, what seems to be the issue as I could read the testimony, and I this is one, uh, Jane, that I'd like to work on in the interim with you and see how we may address this problem. But it seems that, that some owners think that this, this bill, if passed, would, um, 
would take away their right for self-governance, which is just not correct. So I don't know what the uh, misunderstanding of the bill is other than it puts into law that you don't have to have uh, the right to um, um, a non-judicial foreclosure only if it's in your bylaws. So what this says is you don't have to have it in your bylaws, you can do it um, without that. And I think the misunderstanding might be is that we're trying to, to put law uh, out there uh, to govern condo associations when they have their own right via the bylaws. Okay, in this bill, even though it didn't make it out of the legislature, this is the first year of the biennial, right? Right? It's, it's still a, alive. Yeah, the, the legislature is basically a two-year process, right? So if it, it gets introduced and the bill doesn't make it out this year, it doesn't really die, right? Correct. So that means it's still alive and you can work on it next year. And that right. means that bill is still going to have the same bill number, right? And right. we can we we can work on it and revive it. So so if it doesn't make it out of the legislature next year in 2022, then it's dead. Yeah. Right? Then it, we'll that, have to, that, right, that means right. if somebody yeah. wants it, that they have to reintroduce it in 2023. Right. Right. right? right. Okay. Well, why don't we get to the, the next topic is a bill that also didn't make it out of the legislature, but it's kind of controversial. And this is OHA's, mm. uh, OHA's um, uh, I guess, the intent. Because right now we don't know what's going to happen, but they want to build uh, condominiums, residential condominiums on uh, the, their land, Makai of, of, what is it called? Kakako Makai of the Kakako Warner Makai. House. It's all the lands of Oceanside, Makai of Ala Moana Boulevard. On the show. Right there by Ward yeah. Warehouse, right? Where right, Ward correct. Warehouse used to be. And I know there was a bill and they, they wanted to put the condos up and it, that bill died. And then the newspaper says that they're still working on it. So, I mean, if the, if the legislature killed the bill, why are they still working on it? Good question. <laughs> Good question, Jane. <laughs> I don't know. I can't answer that question. I can answer why the bill um, is a bad bill. <laughs> okay. Why why you, yeah, why don't you anyway. talk about that? Yeah. Um, so, so if you look at Kaka'ako, it's an unusual, it's, it's like, um, it's an unusual animal. It's under the Hawaii Community Development Authority. It is under the state. So every place else, so you, you go to um, Waikai or you go to the downtown area, they're all under the city jurisdiction. Even your area is all under the city jurisdiction. So you're, you, you're under the county plan, so to speak. Whereas in, in um, there are three areas in Heia, Kalailoa, and Kaka'ako, we're under the state. State governs us. So it's the Hawaii Community Development Authority, HCDA, has all the zoning requirements. While we may use the city roads and we pay city taxes for the maintenance of it, the zoning, what you build there, is all governed by HCDA, state. And, uh, and so, so too with Makai. So in 2010 or thereabouts, early tw 2010, uh, the, it was the Governor Lingle's administration. A and B wanted to build a high-rise luxury condo on the Makai side, where the parcels are that we were talking about. And, uh, and the community came out in arms. They said, no, this is Shoreline. The legacy here is this is for the people. It's like the People's Park, Ala Moana Park. So too should Makai be open uh, and, and this should all be shoreline for people for years to come. And so uh, they fought it. Um, a and B withdrew. And thereafter, a working group was created to look at how do we do, d deal with and develop Makai. And the law was established then, in 2010 or 2011, that there should be no residential building from Ala Moana Boulevard all the way to the, to the to the shoreline, and that it would go from South Street, you know, by where One Waterfront Towers are, all the way um, to Kewalo. So it was clearly the people's land. Uh, you could build community 
parks, you could build um, a halal uh, training area, community gardens, but it was to be low rise, not residential that would be dense and, and really not appropriate for the area. So in 2012, this is now 2012, um, OHA had, uh, or Native Hawaiians had the, the public trust lands. They said, you know, we were supposed to be paid all of this $200 million that we didn't get all these years. State, you owe us money. You owe us $200 million. And this was then the Abercrombie administration. And, and they said, well, you know what? Can you, you know, we don't have money. Can you take land? So they had a settlement agreement, and that was in law, that they could have, I think it was eight or nine parcels in Kaka'ako Makai. And during that time, they said, well, okay, we'll take the $200 million, but we, we want the highest and best use, meaning, you know, condos and luxury condos is high best use. Um, so we, we want to be able to build residential. Meanwhile, the law was clear, no residential, Makat. So there was a separate bill, a second bill that was also introduced that year to give the rights, the special benefit of, of, of parcels being able to build residential. That bill failed. Two years later, OHA came back and said, we want to build residential. That bill failed. So this is the third time they're coming back. Um, the, the fact of the matter is the way that they're doing it now is they want to have an exemption um, for OHA to build exactly what A and B was told you cannot do. And that therein is a rug. Um, they have, um, they, basically, if it, if it passed, uh, there would be legal challenges because it, it would be a private bill. It is asking for uh, exemption for two parcels on OHA's land where nobody else can build residential on that Makai side. So there's that's one thing. The second is that it's not public lands. So they really don't have the right to do anything they want on the land. It really is governed by HCDA and they have zoning rules. Uh, they have all kinds of restrictions like you've got to give, um, you have to dedicate some public uh, facilities. Uh, they got exempted from that. You have to have a public hearing if you're gonna propose anything on the land. They want an exemption from that. So this bill all around was giving a lot of benefits to OHA that don't come to anybody else in the state. So it is a private special bill that's unconstitutional. So we have been told that, that there would be legal challenges if it were passed. So, so the follow on to that, Jane, was that we put in um, a working group, both um, the, the representative from Kaka'ako, uh, Speaker Psyche, and I had one as a senator from Kaka'ako, uh, put in a resolution on, on both sides, both houses, uh, asking for a, a working group. Let's look at ways in which we can do something else than building residential and high rise luxury residential uh, in an area where it's prohibited. And so that's, that's kind of where it also died. Uh, and OHA says it's, it's going to go forward, but there are a number of problems with their going forward without talking to the community and without talking to HCDA. That's a long way of saying a lot of history there, but that's the concerns I think a lot of the community has with, with this bill. But let me just put in my two cents, okay? You know, because I remember when 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 A and B had the project, and we testified in, in you know way back when, and it was like, you know, guys, we just got done, you know, fighting with the city on Chapter Thirty Eight, you know, the lease residential leasehold condo bill, um, and leasehold condos are a problem. Why are you guys creating another problem? Why would you build leasehold condominiums? I mean, it's like. You know, we just got, I mean, it, it, it caused so many problems. I mean, people died. I mean, they killed themselves. I mean, you know. I recall so, you're helping some of them. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and it, it, the, tra I mean, people, I mean, I mean, people, I mean, there are so many problems with leasehold because leasehold comes to an end. I mean, if it was 99 years and perpetual, then maybe I wouldn't have a concern. But, you know, it's, it's good in the beginning. When you get to the end, there are problems. 
And then it becomes hard to sell. Nobody wants to buy leasehold because you can't get loans. And then you get the rent reopenings, you know, and there are buildings in, 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 in Waikiki now, they're coming to the end of the term mm -hmm. and they have no remedy. And you have mm -hmm. people who are, who are lessees in, in the leasehold condominium and they're just, you know, getting bullied by the fee owners who are saying, you know, this is what I want, take it or leave it, right? And there are people who are living in leasehold condominium. They hope they they passed away before the lease expires, right? They say, "Oh, I'm 86. I'm, I'm I, you know, I, there's nine years left on the lease. I'm going to die before it ends." But if they're if they're lucky and they live beyond that eight or nine years, they're they're not going to have a home, you know. So so to me, it's there's like, a problem with the lease, leasehold leasehold. Yes, but you know, to me, unless you're going to make really long leases that are perpetual, that you can. Like in England, they've got 99 year leases that they've been renewing for hundreds of years. Okay, Th then it's not a problem. But you know, when you've got leases that have an end, have an expiration date, then you're creating a problem for future homeowners. And you know, it's like, why would you do that? After all we went through mm -hmm. in, in Hawaii, right? We had a Supreme Court case that went up for single family homes for leasehold. And then when chapter 38 got passed in the city, and Bishop and State took that up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. told them, hey, we've already decided this issue for Hawaii. And, you know, so you know, don't bother us. You know, it, the, your, your legislature can determine public purpose. And if they want to make public purpose for people to own their own homes, that's okay with us. <laughs> right? And so, you know, it's like, why? The minute I hear leasehold condominiums, I just cringe, you know, like, why would you be wanting to do this all over again you know what you have to do more training <laughs> you have to tell people what the implications are long history and people come in and they jump in and they say we want to do this we want this without knowing you know all the consequences and lessons learned from the past yeah and <laughs> and and these are hard lessons i mean people didn't know you know what was going to happen and then when you get to the end and and you're stuck because now you're, you're the stuck, owner of a yeah. leasehold condominium and your lease is expiring. There's nothing you can do. You can't even sell it, you know. And and those are those are issues that I thought you know we had pretty much resolved. And you know, so that's why whenever I hear stuff about somebody wanting to build a leasehold condominium, I just say I, I just shake my head like why why would you do that? And you know, so I'm kind of do glad more training, Jane. Did you training and broader spectrum of people seeing? Yeah. What what lessons we've learned because you know why keep on doing the same thing over and over that will create problems especially when when you're in these lease lease um, ownerships when you get to the end you're pretty old and pretty much on fixed income and what do you do at that point right you know, really very few options right and that's what I mean that's what I'm seeing in Waikiki in some and, and there's maybe three or four leasehold condominiums and there are elderly people. Who tell me, oh, I'm going to die before the lease expires, and I'm thinking, I hope that's the case because if not, you're not going to have a home. I mean, and there's nothing we can do. There's no, they have no remedy. And you know, to me, you know, that's that's the lesson that we've learned, at least you know now that you know when you do leasehold condominiums, you you are creating a problem, and so it's better not to do it. But you know, we run out of time. Oh and, no! Yeah, it's just getting started. Out of time. <laughs> and, and so. Uh, you know, we're going to have to uh, continue this conversation, I'm sure, uh, in the future sometime. Thank you so much for being. You know, what I do want to suggest, Jane, because you, you're such a condo queen, right, is that haven't passed. Maybe we should have a discussion and maybe one program should be what are the things that didn't pass and should we have it and how can we improve it? And maybe some of your suggestions so that you educate people before the session begins next year. Yeah, maybe that's a good a good idea to do a show like that before the session opens next year. And thank you very much, Senator. Hey, okay, nice to okay. be with you again, Jane. Yeah, thank you uh -huh. for being our guest. And for uh, the Pleasure. people who are listening, thank you for joining us for another episode. And next week, uh, Verlene Tenno is going to be the co-host. And uh, she's going to have John Knorr. And it's going to be two consecutive shows. They're going to be talking about uh, labor law and, and, and how... You know, condominiums uh, are employee uh, employers, and they employ you know the maintenance, uh, the housekeeping, security, and what kind of issues do condominiums as employers have to deal with? 
So we're going to have two weeks of that. Really interesting. Please join us next week and the week after for Condo Insider on labor law issues. And thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you again, Senator, for being my guest. My pleasure. Okay, mahalo.